Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Negotiation. This episode is part two with Bill Tung, Managing Director at Peaks Consulting, continuing our conversation around localizing for consumers in Japan. We dive into COVID and its effects on direct-to-consumer, online consumer strategies in APAC versus North America, how to measure success in retail in APAC, how consumer feedback is gathered and applied, the importance of a good D2C strategy, and its future in e-commerce in the APAC region. Enjoy. Well, I, I think what's sort of uh, surprising to some brands is that even if you get on Tmall Global, oh, you mean I, I need to spend money on marketing as well, specifically with Alibaba? Well, yes, unless you want to be buried on page 286, you need to market it as well, especially if you're a brand that's new to the shores. That's part of that learning process. It's not good enough just to be on the site. It's not good enough just to have inventory nearby, especially if you're a brand that nobody knows and you don't have a physical presence there. So why would you expect people to be flocking? You're not the only one. If you look on the site, there may be a few other brands and companies selling exactly what you're selling. Home to over 4 billion people, the Asia-Pacific region boasts one of the most powerful consumer markets on the planet. Not only is it home to half of the world's under 30 population, but it's also home to more than half the world's internet users. It's a market that no globally minded organization should ignore. But entering markets like China, Japan, or Southeast Asia is no easy task. Just ask the likes of Microsoft, Google, Uber, and Facebook. However, times are changing, and with the right partners, doors are slowly opening as more and more companies find success growing their key markets in APAC. I myself spent eight years in China, mostly as a venture capitalist, helping early-stage tech companies grow in the Asia-Pacific market successfully. This show is dedicated to uncovering and examining successful Asia market entry and growth strategies by interviewing the experts who've done it before and truly understand what it takes to be successful in the region. My name is Todd Embley, and welcome to The Negotiation. Brought to you by WPIC Marketing and Technologies. Let's move on to talking about relationship management, talking about partners. You've obviously been working with, you've probably set up a lot of partnerships over the years. Um, how do you train? Um, how do you how do you how do you manage the relationship management? and help your customers and your clients. Um, let's talk a little bit about relationship management when brands are going and developing those relationships and having partnerships. How should they be managing those relationships? Yeah, I think for for a company that's looking to go global, you know, they'll go to trade shows and and, and that's fine. You're, you're at a trade show and, you know, somebody from Indonesia comes into your booth and say, hey, you know, I, this is my business. I really want to represent you in my country. Uh, and, you know, you don't have the wherewithal to send people to Jakarta or wherever it may be to it's like, well, who would be the best partner? You're just so elated that somebody from Indonesia walked into your booth and what wants to do business with you and is ready to give you purchase orders. And now you're flying. And it's a like, great. And that's how so many companies start off internationally is through a trade show uh, mm. or, 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 or it's whoever knocks on the door first, Todd, whether it's at a trade show or they just were traveling in the States and they approached you. And, and I understand that. that that's low hanging fruit. Great. Now we're off the races and, 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 and we're selling in these countries. Is it the right thing to do? You have no idea. And so you haven't spent the time uh, to to go investigate that marketplace and to go vet through that company and say, well, is there a better alternative there? So th that's why, you know, companies need to investigate or well, hire, invest into personnel, into staff who have experience working in these markets around the world and know what to look for, not what not to look for. And so I think that these are some of the basic ABCs, quite frankly, of, uh, of building those relationships, maintaining relationships. Dot, it, it, there's, you know, certainly COVID put a wrench into all of that, but now oh, that things wow, are opening yeah. back up again. Good point. Yeah, you, there's nothing better than being there. If you just expect, oh, we got two global sales meetings a year and our partners are going to fly in and, and, uh, and uh, we're going to show them, do the song and dance and uh, show them the product. And then they're, they're going to give us their forecast and give us their orders. Well, we've seen them twice a year. That's great. Well, do you have staff that are actually going to visit them to give them training to understand the consumers that your brand has? Um, so I think that those companies that have invested in personnel and, uh, you know, given them pretty significant travel budgets to span the globe and spend time uh, in the marketplace are the ones that are going to win. 
Do you think that applies to the full suite of operating in APAC as a as a, a North American or a European brand? I'm just thinking that, and and I know I'm I'm leading you into an answer that's going to start with, well, it depends. But can you do marketing from abroad? Can you manage distributors from abroad? Like, can you know shipping, logistics, pet? Like, are there certain you know, processes in the business that you can maybe not have to invest as much locally versus others that you really need to like in an order of importance. Is there is there value in having an order of importance or is it like, no, you really need to all things really need to be invested locally? Yeah, I, I think what some companies get in trouble doing, Todd, is that they'll have somebody responsible for the international markets. And they'll have that person report to the vice president of U.S. sales. How's that go? Usually not well, in my <laughs> experience and my observation. Uh, and so it's sort of treating all markets outside the United States as the 51st state or, mm. you know, it's just, oh, it's just, well, it's, it's like Hawaii or Alaska. Uh, and so, no, it, so you, you really need to have people that know what they're doing, ha- have a significant experience and interest that are flying around the world. Uh, and, and, you know, you can have regional offices, great. You can have your regional office in Amsterdam, you got a regional office in Singapore, that's great. But, but most importantly is that, you know, you have to have that C-suite that through that organization in the head office that really understands uh, that, you know, we're operating in many, many markets around the world. And if we happen to be an American company and our headquarters is in Chicago, the U.S. is just one of the markets that we are conducting business and that our consumers are everywhere. Um, And and I, I think the days, Todd, where all things, all ideas, all products, all marketing, it all emanates from this castle in the sky called the global headquarters is long gone. It exists. But I think that those companies that truly understand the global consumer, the global marketplace, understands that, you know, product innovation, R&D can be done around the world. Marketing ideas don't always have to be one message to you get one goal, one objective, but how you execute and how you communicate with consumers around the world. Sometimes it's stage left and sometimes it's stage right. Uh, so I think this is how uh, companies evolve from, quote unquote, exporting to becoming a global brand. Yeah. Slight tack. As you were mentioning about, you know, trade shows and things got me thinking about events and uh, you would see some technology manufacturing. You'd have like one of the, the largest lighting uh, uh, trade shows in the world in Hong Kong, like a five day long at the huge Hong Kong, you know, convention center <laughs> down right <laughs> on the water, you know, the it's just like yeah. really big, right? Yeah. Um, however, being with Columbia, which is extremely sports adjacent in most of its uh, uh, apparel and fashion um, driven messaging mm-hmm. and marketing uh, and usage and function. Um, how, it, it, you know, and then to think, well, the, your time, you, you were there while well, during the 2008 Olympics, mm. right? There they feed you World Cups, you know, world, world championships of baseballs, maybe in Japan and things, you know, how important were the growth and, and increased frequency of more global sports adjacent events and trade shows and, and, and World Cups and things going on uh, in there. And how did you take advantage of those when, they, when those opportunities arose? Yeah, I mean, those big events to be a sponsor, Todd, of those events, you know, you're writing really large checks and, and oh, those yeah. with, for the Nikes and the Adidas of the world. Uh, you know, certainly at Columbia, it was very much done at a grassroots. You know, it was sponsoring skiing events, sponsoring uh, snowboard events, uh, uh, getting the clothes on the instructors. Uh, you know, so these were lower cost events, uh, but just to get the brand out there. Uh, with the end consumers and, 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 and the thought leaders uh, and the key opinion leaders is what we used to call what they're called today. But back in the day, they were just uh, sorry about the noise there uh, it was just really about the people that were influencing. And those were very much about the instructors uh, and uh, that were leading those particular activities. You know, it inspired me to re- I, as we parlay into video, I really want to start asking people to, to, to remind the audience 
where we're based. Where are you based? Where are you sitting right now? I- I'm in Boston, Todd. You're in Boston. You're in Boston. Now, and, and thank you for, for leaning in on that. Um, I think a lot of those events, uh, obviously now we can't really comment to, and we'll see what the after effects of COVID have been on, you know, all of those. I mean, we're just seeing things like tech conferences and whatnot. Those right. are all just starting. But I mean, it was a solid two years off from a lot yeah, of that. Correct. You know, so maybe before we get into our last big topic of direct to consumer, Maybe let's just touch a little bit and and we'll talk about COVID on D to C, right? So we we will get to that. But generally speaking with as as far as um, marketing, distribution, manufacturing, the hiccups and the headaches and the ability to sponsor events. I mean, where did those budgets go? Did they just get paused? Were they repurposed into other activities? What was the impact of, of, of COVID in that world? I think brands learned, oddly enough, Todd, that you, know, you could still conduct business without travel. Uh, you could still get uh, the factories to produce uh, new designs. Uh, the product team didn't need to fly off uh, to the factories. The sourcing team didn't have to go to the uh, factories. You could do global sales meetings virtually. Uh, and uh, orders were placed uh, and, and shipments were made, albeit very late because of logistics. So I think certainly that has happened. Is that the right way to do things? No, I think that's for established businesses, Todd. You know, the Nikes of the world don't need to pull people together uh, physically. You know, it, it, it's, it's, these are very well-oiled machines. I mean, I'm sure they had their hiccups and even for, you know, medium-sized companies, but for companies that had this process in place, it was just going online uh, for that for that process. But if you're a new business and you're breaking out in the markets, you know you you, you don't have that infrastructure, that foundation, that history, that institutional knowledge to to it's still in the making. So you still need to do that groundwork and get people out to the factories and get out people out to retail and to see what's going on in, in the marketplace. Um, so I think, yeah, it, I think it certainly slowed down the development of the international marketplace for a lot of companies that were, were new at it, quite frankly, just because they couldn't fly people around the world. Okay, great. Thanks. I appreciate you diving into that one. Uh, now, aforementioned, moving on to D to C, you've had, you know, the tenured experience to have both worked with distributors and set up all the distribution channels, but also the D to C and helping set up proper D to C channels as well. I guess maybe, you know, the first question is, you know, what have you learned in the process of being in the game as the game changed Mm. and do you find a brand can be closer to its consumers in a d2c environment yeah well without a doubt so so as the game changed and you know the days before e-com uh you know how did brands sell that they they wholesaled or or they retailed it themselves uh, so I clearly remember having strategic discussions uh, on a global basis. Well, how is this going to upset the apple cart? You know, it's like it's it's our our traditional wholesale base was already upset because we opened up outlet stores and uh, branded retail stores because they thought we were competing with them. And now we're going online direct to consumer in a major way. Uh, so I think that caused a lot of internal angst and discussions internally of, of, of how we're uh, competing against our customers, our wholesale accounts. Uh, so well, the, the, I think that 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 that, that uh, decision's already been made quite some time ago. It's just like, well, the hell with it. We, we have no choice where we have to go direct to consumer uh, on an online basis. It's just that that question is, are you working with the Amazons of the world uh, mostly, or are you going direct yourself to the consumer? You know, a brand like Nike stopped with Amazon, right? Is that they want to gear all of their consumers to Nike.com uh, and, uh, and, and away from Amazon. So I think that those, dis- those discussions, uh, no companies have these discussions anymore. Or do we or do we not go online? And the question is, is just how are you going to uh, approach that either directly or indirectly? One, I, I, I've ha- always believed that, you know, D2C and being online was a great place to be because 
you were actually a lot closer to your consumers with regards to proximity of how they really feel and an opportunity to tap into um, that data and gathering sentimental data points is so much more available through that online presence. Do you find, and and I, I wanna dive into that a little bit, but first of all, the chain reaction of that data, I know maybe in North America, it's fairly robust. I, I think if the consumer base in North America says jump, the brand says how high. Is that similar in APAC? Yes, I, I, I would, I would, I, I do believe so that that is because you're not, you're going to know, Todd, what are your best sellers is uh, we, we sold more black than we did purple. Well, okay. Well, that, that's what the data shows, but let me take a step back. I think when we talk about DTC, Todd, it, it, it you know, I think we, I don't, retail is not dead. Uh, it certainly have a few nails in the coffin, as we've seen, uh, certainly in North America, but I think certainly in Asia, it's alive and well. And certainly if you're a new brand coming into the marketplace, if you're just going to expect to have success with an online strategy, when the consumer doesn't have the ability to touch and feel and experience your brand. Um, so without a brick and mortar strategy, I think that's going to be quite challenging. If we look at Allbirds, you know, Allbirds started off out of San Francisco and it was mostly an online strategy. And then they had a few stores, you know, one in New York City, one here in Boston, you know, one in San Francisco, obviously downtown and, and a few others. Uh, but internationally, you know, I think that their success, quite frankly, was not as fast as they expected because I think the consumer shops differently. They weren't as aware of this brand. And so you still do need a degree of brick and mortar presence so consumers can touch, smell, breathe your brand, put it on their feet, a novel idea. Uh, and, and then you sort of overlay that with your online strategy. So it's not one or the other of, of that direct to consumer. Yeah, I think you still need to have that online strategy and also that brick and mortar commitment as well. Yeah, that's true. It's interesting. And, and, and I, a bit of a leading question, because I, I believe I've heard this too. It's the retail isn't designed for sell. You wouldn't measure success of retail through revenue. You, how do you measure it? I, that's a really, really good question. I think it encompasses that whole entirety of that omni-channel. It, it's part and parcel of the whole mix. Obviously, if you're making that commitment of opening retail stores, Todd, you want it to be profitable, right? I mean, nobody expects, uh, well, nobody wants, I would say, to be making that overhead, that significant investment, think, oh, we're going to lose money. Some brands do, though, because they believe that's not also a marketing investment for the brand as, as well. It is. I mean, it's 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 where they experience. We used to say they would shop offline, but they would buy online, separating shopping from purchasing. Absolutely. It, you know, 30 years ago, shopping was was buying. Nobody Correct. thought to separate the two instances of looking, trying on, driving around, but then actually the card and, and, and separating yourself from your money. Absolutely. And, you know, it, it, it's interesting in Japan with Columbia Sportswear, you know, Columbia Sportswear in the United States was a wholesaler. It, it was not a retailer. Uh, and it very much was the thought was, well, we're going to do that same go to market strategy in Japan. Uh, yes, of course, we did wholesale in Japan, but the need for mono brand retail was immense. So, so we went down that path of developing a lot more retail. There are probably more retail in Japan than there is in the United States for Columbia Sportswear. It certainly has a higher percentage of total sales. It's probably half uh, of, of the revenue in, in Japan today for the brand between branded stores and outlet stores uh, ver versus wholesale. Um, so uh, combining the, the, the online business as, as well. But it was just a very different way of going to market and reaching those consumers. Um, so yeah, sometimes your, your go-to-market strategy in your home country, you say, oh, well, in the United States, we're 50% online and we're 25% wholesale and 25% our own retail. Okay. But you know, you're going to other countries that that mix is going to be very different. The question will be, why would it be the same? So confirm or deny a rumor I once heard that in Asia, our APAC consumers, they like to shop offline. They like to buy online 
than they like to return offline. Is that true? I, I've heard I, I've heard that before. Listen, I, I think if shopping was an Olympic sport, I, I think the Asians would win gold, silver, and bronze uh, year after year because it's also a source of entertainment, I, and it's also this Todd. And let's just take the big cities: Tokyo, Shanghai, Jakarta, Bangkok. People live in small homes, Todd. I, I, I think if you look at, I think. A, Seven, eight of the world's largest shopping malls by square feet or square meters are based in Asia. Actually, mostly in the Philippines, oddly, oddly enough. But um, yeah, no, it's, these shopping malls are immense. And so it is a form of entertainment. It is a form of, you know, if you're living in an 800 square foot flat, you know, the family goes out. And you're not spending a lot of time at home. Uh, and you're not usually entertaining friends yeah. at home. It's usually done outside. Family, yes, but uh, so so I think, think people are spending a lot more time outside. Where are they spending their time outside? Unfortunately, well, fortunately, they're spending a lot of time at retail, whether it's on street or shopping malls or department stores. This is you know, and it, and this is where the whole you know bartering, right? And it just like it. You're right. It is a sport, and it was always hilarious to me to go out and and I you know, be out going to buy something and you do the bartering and this and that and the walk away and the comeback and the, you know, the, the whole game. And you could be screaming at each other and then you finally reach an agreement on a price and it, uh, you're best friends. You know, everybody's climbing, show friends. You know, the 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 friends from the other stores around are coming over and everybody says, it's like, you might as well pop a bottle of champagne. That was so fun, right? It was just... It's the oddest experience um, to go through. <laughs> and it's, and, you know, and for me, I was just shocked at the beginning that how this turn of events of like, I thought this guy was going to strangle me. And now he wants to introduce me to his wife. You know, it's like, this is the craziest turn of events. But that wouldn't happen in Japan, though, Todd. You know, if, if I say the product, if it's 2,000 yen, 20,000 yen, 2 million yen, that's it. There's no, that. there's not that culture of negotiating there's that respect that's the price that's what i'm going to pay right. yes or no there's not there's not so that again so we say apac yeah that happens in korea certainly happens in china uh, not at proper retail not in a department store or a, a louis vuitton in shanghai of course but you know it's usually on the side streets uh, uh and things like that which which is a lot of fun to do I wanted to ask what you do with uh, consumer feedback, uh, you know, in, in, in that region. Is it applied differently? Is it collected differently? Is it analyzed differently? And is there a difference in impact? Do they, you know, it, you know, if, if, if the consumers say jump, do the brands really say how high? I, I think in Asia, and I'm talking about brands, I think Asian companies, especially Japanese companies, yeah, the consumer is absolute king, emperor, god, whatever it may be. I think that that is a very significant difference. Uh, whereas I think, you know, not to generalize too much tide on American companies, well, this is our strategy, this is our product, this is our marketing, and we're going to try to shove it down everybody's throats. I, I think in Japan, that focus on the consumer is on steroids. It, it always has been. The, the customer service piece uh, and, and the product development piece it is very much about the consumer, consumer, consumer always uh, in, in mind. You know, you hear the stories of, you know, when, when companies make faulty products or a consumer has had some uh, problem with a company, the, the, the Japanese uh, president goes to that consumer's home with his entourage of executives and, uh, you know, is bowing and giving gifts because they've so offended that consumer. And you know, imagine that happening in the States. It, it just wouldn't. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's respect, culture uh, difference, especially in Japan. There's there's so much of what I I'd, I'd like to unpack about that because there is a consumer profile differential in because like let's face it North America is a very litigious culture and people take advantage of squeaky wheel gets the grease Mm. Um, obviously, that is not happening in APAC for whatever reason. There's a cultural difference there. You're obviously, if it happened too often, you know, chairman of the board wouldn't wouldn't have the time to be able to visit so many homes. Sure, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, but you know, we we see this at retail. If you've ever shopped retail in Tokyo, you, you, you know, even if you're buying a a lowly T-shirt from Uniqlo, 
It's folded properly. It's put in the bag. You're thanked for making the purchase and you're treated with respect and, and you've bought a $10 t-shirt. You know, that just that level of customer service just really doesn't exist uh, here in the United States. Yeah, you're really making me miss living there. Yeah. I, I loved that, just that level of, of respect uh, for consumer um, that is, is so prevalent there. Um, talk a little bit more about uh, D2C and... You know, with 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 you and I, you obviously have a lot longer tenure in the region than I do, but we have really come to know the importance of having a good D to C strategy for the region. But I do suspect and I do hear and I am told that this is still not known by everybody. Um, can you confirm or deny that? Like, is this not not a hundred percent saturation of of knowledge? Uh, are you still seeing companies that aren't really building proper D two C uh, strategies going into the area? And then, what advice are you giving them now? Well, I, I think what's sort of uh, surprising to some brands is that even if you get on Tmall Global uh, Marketplace in, in China, for example, it's like, oh, oh you mean I, I need to spend money on marketing as well, it's specifically with Alibaba? Well, yes, unless you want to be buried on page 286. So yeah, congratulations. You're now on the site. You set that all up. And even if you've got local 3PL inventory in, in Shanghai or wherever, uh, okay, well, you need to market it as well, especially if you're a brand that's new to the shores. So, so I'm saying that's, that, that's part of that learning process. It's not good enough just to be on the site. It's not good enough just to have inventory nearby. Uh, you, you need to do the proper market, especially if you're a brand that nobody knows. And, and you don't have a physical presence there. So why would you expect people to be flocking? You're not the only one. They're just, if you look on the site, there may be a few other brands and companies selling exactly what you're selling. Have you, you're going to dovetail into COVID a little bit for a couple of different points. One, I want to talk a little bit about the interruption to the manufacturing, you know, this sure. containers, globs of containers in one area of the world, none in the other, right. buildups at the ports, certain protocols that have to be now uh, that have backed everything up. Where, where did, what, what happened? How, how, what was the fallout and the impact as we start to come out the other side? I wanted to, maybe if you could just talk a little bit about the fallout as you saw it from a high level and how has that now changed the game? Yeah, well, certainly factories being closed due to COVID, whether they were in southern China or in Vietnam, uh, specifically to or, or other countries. Well, there's your bottleneck right there, uh, number one, and then exacerbated by container issues and uh, labor strike issues. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of companies uh, have to spend a lot of money on air freight. Uh, which obviously nobody wants to do. But I, I know it was like come Christmas of 2020 and even Christmas of 2021, you know, there was just a lot less inventory that were coming into retail here in the United States. So I think retailers, I don't have data on this time, was like, okay, well, we don't have to discount as much because we don't have as much inventory. Um, so, you know, usually uh, they're, they're not discounting as much uh, just because the supply chain had slowed down. And also, which led to the inflation that we're, lo we're looking at uh, today. That's got everybody in, in, a, in, in an uproar. But uh, I think that those are part of the issues. And then, you know, just geopolitically, then the whole question is, oh, well, we shouldn't be so reliant on any particular countries. I won't name any here, Todd. Uh, but so it, it's also how do you diversify your source base? But, you know, th so much of this was impacting, you know, manufacturing throughout Asia. OK, so moving into a brave new world again. Uh, <laughs> for retail, uh, like you know, the internet and e-commerce and all the things was it wasn't enough. Now, now we uh, we have COVID, uh, we have wars, um, you know, we have we have political tensions, we have also all kinds of fun uh, going on all over the place. Talking about D 2 C impact of what COVID, but now coming out 
post COVID. Where do you think D 2 C retail is headed uh, in the next few years, uh, specifically in the in the APAC region? Yeah, just bigger and bigger and bigger because I think that's the writing on the wall. I, it, there's no going back uh, from that standpoint, Todd. And so I think those companies that understand it can execute it, have the right strategic plans, uh, are, are going to be the ones that come out as winners there. Um, you know, so whether it's the, the, those shopping festivals in China that T Mall or JD has, or whether Coupang has, I, I think that in, in, in Korea, I, I think that that is uh, the the big Big nugget. But again, I, I think it's part of an overall omni-channel strategy that needs to be executed and not just say, we're just going to go online and in these three countries and we're going to magically all of a sudden it's going to be somehow uh, very, very successful for us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks very much, uh, Bill. It has been amazing. We have been talking for a while. Last question. And I believe we did this on uh, our podcast as well. And we do this with a lot of our guests because when you have great guests, they know uh, other great guests. And so we encourage you to drop some names so that we can go after them on social or go hit them up and say, Bill Tongue recommended you. Is there one or two names or people that you think would make great guests that you would even be inspired to listen to on this show? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and, and a lot of them are, are people that I have worked with uh, in, in the past as well. Uh, if you, here's a gentleman that's in Tokyo. Um, uh, he's he's uh, here, here's a real Japanese name for you, Todd. His name's Massimo Lazari. Uh, so he grew up in northern Italy, uh, studied Japanese, uh, went over to Tokyo as a young executive. I think it was with Ferragamo. And uh, he's never left. Uh, so, um, yes. So, so I think that he'd be really a brilliant person to talk about. Uh, uh, I hired him at Columbia Sportswear. He's still the GM of uh, Columbia Sportswear Japan. But he really under, he's worked with Italian brands, Ferragamo, uh, Todd's. Uh, Miss 60 group, as I recall. So he really understands like, okay, on the ground, much closer than I myself, by the way, I was like, okay, here are the pitfalls, the do's and don'ts of uh, international brands uh, with that go to market strategy uh, in, in, in Japan. So he, he'd certainly uh, be on the top of that list for, for, for Tokyo. Absolutely. There's another gentleman, uh, Jeff Daggett, an American. He's been living in Tokyo for, Oh God, maybe 30 years. Uh, Nike, Gap, uh, some other brands. And uh, yeah, so these people really understand and they lived, lived, lived through it uh, and all those challenges and the pitfalls. So, All right. Well, I appreciate you, you know, throwing their names out here, giving us the opportunity to go to them and 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 just say, hey, you were mentioned uh, and happy to do gives so. us the opportunity to try to uh, uh, uniquely be able to uh, acquire them onto the show for all of you listening uh, to be able to hear what they have to say and, and learn from their uh, expertise and, and from everything that they've done with their careers. However, we are going to wrap this one up here. Uh, Bill, can't thank you enough for coming on the show. For those of you listening in audio and you want to see us uh, live and in person, of course, we are now recording with video and we are uh, you know, running everything out to our WPIC YouTube channel. So please go ahead and check out there. A a lot more information, a lot more uh, documentation, a lot more written information on that channel as well. Links to different things that we've been talking about. Uh, a great resource as well for everybody listening to to get more information about this entire show and everything that we talk about. So, uh, Bill Tong, thank you very, very much for coming on the show again. We really appreciate it. Uh, thank you. And always happy to be uh, having conversations with you. Always very lively and uh, really, really thought provoking. Thank you very much. Growing a company is hard. Doing it in a foreign market? Exponentially so. The best piece of advice I can give you is not to do it alone. When you start looking at the Asia-Pacific region for further expansion possibilities, and I sincerely hope you do, make sure you choose the right partners to do it with. My good friends at WPIC Marketing and Technologies have almost 20 years of experience helping brands, just like yours, enter China, Japan, and Southeast Asia. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Negotiation, and if you're interested in being a guest or want to connect with me or any of our team, please reach out to us at podcast at WPIC.co, and be sure to rate, comment, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.